All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here today. I assume we're going to have a few more uh, people joining as this goes on. Um, we're going to spend a few minutes just on some introduction type of stuff. Um, our, our usual host uh, is unable to be here, so uh, she's at a conference. So uh, I'm uh, acting as your host today. And of course, I don't have her proper slide templates and all of the other stuff that she normally does. So what I'm going to offer you uh, for an intro, or not intro, but the poll and a few other things here is going to be a pretty poor facsimile of what Amy normally does, but uh, uh, hopefully we'll get the point across here. So uh, let me switch over to the slides here just real quick. Yeah. Oh, Anthony, you've got to uh, allow me to share my screen as well as Patrick too, I guess. Okay. I thought everybody had that access. Um, shoot. I'll share screen. Okay. Give me a second. Can you see if you have access now? Let's see. There we go. Thank you. Yep, I do. Um, screen, screen. Here we go. All right. So I apologize for the right off the bat, the very poor quality of my slides. So like I said, I don't have the proper templates that Amy has. She's got great logos and you know Berkeley and Skydeck and the lab and all this great stuff. And I have zip. So anyways, uh, apologies for the poor slides. Um, so I want to welcome everyone to today's uh, UC Berkeley Cloud Meetup. Um, thank you all for joining. We're very excited to have a, a wonderful speaker for you all today, um, which we'll get to here shortly. Um, but per Amy's uh, normal method, we're going to uh, start off with a quick poll. Um, and uh, I do mean very quick. Um, since uh, I don't have Amy's account, it's a two slide poll. So uh, let me uh, switch over to that real quick. Uh, let me share my the proper screen for this one. Uh, give me one second. Once again, uh, where did it go? Go. Uh, let's see. This is not the right one. I love trying to find. Oh, here we go. Ooh, perfect. Here we go. All right. This should be it. There we go. Okay. Um, so to join the poll, as you can see, you just go to uh, www.menti.com and enter the code as you see, or they also offer a QR code. So we'll give it a minute here. Oh, I can see people joining. So it's just, uh, since uh, Amy has the paid account, I've got the free version. We have two, count them, two and two slides or poll questions. There we go. Okay. And I've never done this before. So this will be uh, hopefully not an utter and total disaster. So let's go to, uh, let's go to the first one. So just out of curiosity, where is everybody coming from? Um, are you UC Berkeley student? Are you a staff or are you? LBNL, the lab. Let's see some good representation. Um, or are you outside another uh, uh, EDU, another university, another academic institution that is not UC Berkeley, um, or just an outside guest that comes from somewhere else? From AWS. There we go. Oh, Alex, I recognize your name. Yeah, thanks for, for letting me join. Yeah, yeah, glad to have you here. All right, wow, so quite a few LBNLers and a lot of UC Berkeley people. So it's always fun to kind of see what kind of representation we have. And then getting to the, come on, there we go. The most important thing. Have you heard of the materials project before today? Boo, there we go, yes. I don't know if I can vote, but I'd be a big thumbs up. Well, well I voted <laughs> Patrick, yes. I think, I think Patrick voted yes. So, well. Good. More than a few. So fantastic. Like I said, a pretty, uh, that, that's all I got for the poll here. So uh, let me switch back over to the slides, but always kind of curious to see both where people are coming from and who's got some, some basic knowledge of, of what's, what we're about to talk about today. So let me uh, go back to my slides here. Where are we? Uh, slides. I love just zoom is just the best sometimes. Uh, where is my slide deck? Oh, here we go. Back to this. All right, and screen sharing is loading. Oh, that's the wrong one. And there we go. This is the right one. Okay, so we did this already. Okay, um, I'm going to turn over briefly to Anthony to talk about next month's meetup uh, around chat GPT. Anthony. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, next month, we do have a very exciting panel. Uh, this is our first panel, I believe, in the cloud meetup in the, since we've been doing it for now almost four years. Uh, we will be talking about Things like ChatGTP, but I think it will be a more broader conversation about 
uh, generative AI and what it means for, at the university level. Um, I think we want to take it uh, from a perspective of an IT professional on campus and uh, look at things such as costs, data privacy, and other issues that I think is not part of the mainstream conversation yet. Uh, as we all know, it has had a major impact on many industries and especially higher, higher education learning uh, to art and design to programming, but uh, definitely has implications for day to day functioning in the university too. So yeah, it'll be an exciting panel. Uh, if you have suggestions or questions uh, uh, for the panel, uh, please do, you know, you can message me right now or email us. Um, it will be, uh, I think a few of the presenters will be actually is on this call right now, actually. Um, but yeah, it will be a very exciting panel uh, with a broad array of campus leaders um, uh, with knowledge about uh, ChatGTP and all the other generative AI solutions. So yeah, looking forward to it, and uh, please do come next next end of next month. Yeah, take so it back. What what date is it? The twenty April. 20th? Uh, it's the usually last Thursday of each month. So I need to check. We be sure it is the. I think it's twenty seventh. Yes, okay. based on what I. Yeah, last Thursday of the month. So uh, should yes. be a great talk. There's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to arrange a really great talk for everyone for this one. So I, I highly encourage everyone to, to come to this one. Um, should be should be fantastic uh, speakers and discussion. So transitioning into today's meetup. So um, this is a talk around the materials project. Um, it, you can see this is the description, copy and paste it from the invite. Um, I personally have been hearing about the materials project since I actually first started the lab uh, four years ago now. Um, and an absolutely fantastic project. This is really exciting to, to get this talk today um, based on from my perspective, what I've seen the team do over the last number of years as they've transitioned their workflow, their tooling, um, everything they've done with the project itself, but also how they've upgraded, evolved, um, expanded. Uh, fantastic, uh, really exciting project to hear about. Um, always one of my favorite ones to uh, to hear about. Um, also a really fantastic speaker, uh, Dr. Patrick Huck. Um, as you can tell uh, from the, the images I have here, he's he's, He's done a number of talks. He's a very accomplished a number of talks. He's a very accomplished speaker. Um, he's been leading um, my portion of the involvement with uh, the materials project. Um, for those who don't know, um, I manage the, the cloud program at the lab. And so Patrick and I have worked together uh, for since I've been going uh, at the lab uh, to, uh, to help him expand his usage of cloud, get him the resources he needs. Um, I've been lucky enough to kind of watch him as, as he's done all these various talks uh, on uh, on these various subjects around uh, the materials project. Um, and uh, it's just really, really exciting. I'm really excited to, to hear the, the latest and greatest um, from, uh, from Patrick. So uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, stop sharing and turn it over to Patrick. Um, to, uh, Thanks, do his Jeff. Thing. So I'm just really excited. So thank you, Patrick, for agreeing to do this today. And uh, I'm turning over to you. Absolutely. Yeah. This is this is going to be hard to follow up. What an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. This is uh, it's a, sounds like a great community to talk about uh, what we've done with, with Matthias project. I'm just going to start my uh, slide deck real quick in the hope that you all can see that well enough. You guys good? All right. Um, no responses. No responses. Uh, no, we're not seeing it. No, no share yet. We yeah, no share yet. Yet. Oh, yeah. oh, hold on. I might have just. Let's try this again. There you go. How about now? Yes. All right. Play show. So good. Yes. Yep. All right. Look at that. Um, yeah, as Matt said, uh, as Jeff said, um, I'll be talking about transitioning the materials project to the cloud. I'm uh, the senior slash principal engineer on the materials project. Um, this has been going on probably, hmm, we could say maybe end of 2018, 2019 is when I started working with the cloud and there were some aspects of the materials project infrastructure that I wanted to move to the cloud. And then from then on out, it just kind of kept growing and growing and uh, as of uh, mid last year, we basically have our entire website and API infrastructure in the AWS cloud and we're serving the, the world now about 350,000 users actually 
um, and have transitioned away from on-premise um, website um, and API support, basically. Um, a little bit about me. My background is in high energy nuclear physics. And then after I um, graduated PhD, I um, switched to the materials project. I've been at LBNL since 2010 now and in materials project since 2014. I remember group meetings in 2014 when I first joined where we had five people in the group meeting. I was the first staff member um, in, in Mathilde's project and now we have group meetings at, at 40, 40 people. We also uh, back then had 5,000 users. Now we have 350,000 users. So it's been quite a ride. Um, in terms of the agenda, um, I'll introduce Mathilde's project a little bit. I'll talk about the cloud architecture on AWS that we've uh, um, designed and uh, deploy and, and run in production. We're using Datadog as a cloud monitoring service um, that, that pairs really well with AWS. It's also an AWS uh, partner. And then another um, crucial ingredient to our architecture is a uh, open source Kong gateway, which does all the microservice uh, uh, abstraction layer. So routing requests uh, from, the, from the load balancer to the backend services. Um, that'll be the last piece. Um, so to introduce the materials project, we started in uh, 2011 as uh, part of the materials genome initiative. That was a White House initiative uh, under the Obama administration. And the goal was to make materials uh, design uh, faster, less expensive, and more predictable. The materials project was a key player in that initiative and was actually highlighted in the original white paper. Um, because the uh, transition that we enabled from the computational side was to go from um, designing material in, in, in materials in terms of a kind of like an Edisonian approach. You know, um, Edison was kind of looking for tungsten and he tried and kept trying one, that one by one and he threw away most of those things that he did, synthesized it, uh, tried to analyze the material where it worked, threw it away and then eventually find the holy, holy grail. Um, and what we want to do for materials project was basically uh, switch that to a, an uh, in situ approach where we uh, calculate a wide variety of materials and electronic properties, uh, our data can then be used to basically uh, filter and extract uh, uh, materials that are suitable for a certain application. And that um, reduces the uh, amount of options that an experimentalist has uh, or has to go through uh, significantly. So um, originally, I think uh, in 2011, the time to market for a lot of these technologies that we provide data for um, was uh, around 30 years and it's slowly starting um, to come down and hopefully keeps coming down further. Um, the screenshots that you see here, um, especially on the left and that, that I've shared in, in the announcement is as our new website um, that, that we have uh, um, made public globally uh, mid of last year. And um, the director is Christine Pearson. So she founded Materials Project in 2011. And as I said, I joined in 2014. Um, so what is the materials project? Just to dive, dive in a little bit deeper. Uh, we are a database of inorganic crystalline material structures and their properties. We have three major pillars that we are trying to, um, that we uh, rely on. One is we want to accelerate materials discovery primarily through uh, advanced scientific computing. So that's a lot of high performance computing. And then also the um, write analysis software that enables the design. We scale these computations across all inorganic compounds. And we'll try to make data-driven predictions based off the based on these uh, calculations. And then the third pillar is the is the open source dissemination, open science pillar, where we uh, try to enable the larger community to use our data and design tools to find materials and write publications that those users go from from industry through education and and government all across the board. Um, on the in the left on the left side in this in this slide, you can see our database entries. Um, the crystal structure entry is basically either is the, the basis of what we call a material. So we are about 150,000 materials in now. They are all unique and separate from each other. I think to calculate these 150,000 materials and all these properties that we provide with them, uh, I think we used over 100 million CPU hours. So this doesn't really correlate with uh, how many structures we actually and unique calculations we had to run. It's basically only the things that we had to that we, after the fact, analyzing our 200 terabytes of data, finding that these are unique and can be kind of called a material in the material science sense. 
Um, we also have molecules. Uh, and then for each of the uh, materials, we have things like density of states, density of tensor properties, charge densities, uh, X-ray absorption spectra. So, and you can see in this graph since 2011, we've, we've kept growing and adding properties uh, to our database. Uh, on the right, that's the uh, total user count since the inception of MP. Uh, the insert is our growth, monthly growth. And you can see it as we, the red one is, is, is uh, the legacy website that we've been running until uh, mid early, mid 2022. And then we switched to our new uh, website. And and since then the website has taken taken over and legacy has kind of ebbed out. But overall the um, the growth is still still exponential. We're adding about I would say 10,000 users a month right now still, and it doesn't look like we're slowing down. Um, and uh, as you can see, we're, we're about to hit the 350,000 um, users soon. Um, then in terms of how kind of that science works, uh, we people discover novel materials, mostly through screening and learning. Um, and on the right, you can see kind of the infamous funnel, uh, funnel that we always talk about, you'd, you'd, you'd start, at the top with a with the materials uh, on materials project that are coming into this funnel and you apply screening criteria one two three to get this down in order of magnitudes to say to the order of 10 candidates you kind of try to synthesize those or analyze those find uh, maybe common denominators or things that work for these materials uh, and uh, either call that a success or close the loop and go back and say, I've learned something that I could put in, into my machine learning models, uh, come up with new calculations that are basically informed by the things that I've learned and feed them back into this, this funnel and the calculation cycle. And that way we keep keep growing and exploring the, the space of materials. As examples, it's it's a long, long list. Um, I'm not an, not an expert in explaining every one of those, but it goes from oxidic mag magnetic caloric uh, materials, piezoelectrics, batteries, so electrolyte materials, electro electrode materials, then also things that are used in touch screens and LCDs, uh, the transparent conducting oxides, the water splitting for photocatalysis. So the, the, the range is, is wide. And uh, we have white papers and um, book chapters where we kind of go into details of what examples were. Uh, where Materials Project has really accelerated that material design aspect. Um, our website, uh, and these are all screenshots from our uh, from our latest website. Now on the left, you can see the Materials Explorer. Basically, a user can use the um, uh, the table of elements and a search bar to narrow down the list of materials that we have to things that he's interested in, and then also use uh, filters on the composition, on symmetry, calculated properties, long list of things to find what they're interested in. Uh, so basically that way, Materials Project has become a, a Google for materials for a lot of people. And uh, on the right is our uh, documentation for the API. So we not only provide uh, an interface to all our data and, and analysis tools, we uh, also provide that data in form of an API for people to, to do uh, high throughput uh, programmatic analyses. Um, what I forgot to mention on the left though, the analysis tools also include other apps that are targeted for specific um, aspects of materials project like the phase diagram, per bay diagram, uh, reaction calculator. And uh, in the future, we'll also have apps that are contributed by the, by the community. Because the way we've written this uh, infrastructure is that that users can come in and with Python experience should be uh in a good situation to write their own interfaces for data that they maybe are domain experts in and we would basically as a small mp team not have to do all the web development for the domain but can for the domain scientists but can rely on their expertise to write it for us um so just to kind of go through this i've alluded to it this is all based on on plotly dash that's what enables writing python based interfaces um We've kind of developed a framework for for how to do this. Uh, Plotly Dash is doing the heavy lifting for it, uh, and then the list of uh, properties that we have just keeps growing. So you can see in, in one of the example here is aluminum oxide. This is one of our materials detail pages where we show an interactive uh, crystal structure that you can turn and click and download. You get some of the basic um, properties uh, for this materials and uh, and the crystal structure, but you could also get an auto generated description. 
based on the symmetry properties and the composition of the material that a user can use. And then if we go through this, we have, yeah, this is what this looks like interactively, thermodynamic stability, electronic structures, uh, diffraction patterns where users can use the interface to kind of do smearing or apply uh, other uh, filters that would uh, change this diffraction pattern, for instance, uh, aqueous stability, um, magnetic properties in terms of uh, um, also then uh, el elastic constants, so the tensors, bulk modulus, shear modulus, the electric constants, equation of state, so uh, charge densities, these are pretty pretty heavy to calculate and pretty big objects, so that's a data management challenge in the in the background. Um, substrates kind of trying to figure out which sub which substrate would I use to in, to grow a certain film and all alloys is something that we've just um, um, released too. So you can see how this serves a, a very wide range of material scientists and in industry and academia. Uh, one uh, additional capability that we've had for a while now is that users can also contribute their own data to materials projects. So our data is only uh, computational. Uh, we call that the core data that we where we run the calculations or accept um, MP compatible calculations from the from the community. But we can also now accept contributed data that can be experimental and or computational and uh, expose this to our entire community um, through a framework called MP Contrips. Um, yes. Okay, so just to keep digging deeper a little bit, what does um, overall our science and develop uh, and operations processes in materials product look like. We have software that has been in place for a while now, Atomate, Custodian, and Fireworks that takes care of running workflows, uh, meaning um, we start with a, a basic uh, calculation that, that relaxes the structure, and then we have additional workflows that, based on that, calculate the properties that I've talked about. The analysis software for that, where all these objects are defined, is called PyMagen. Uh, Fireworks is the software that does um, all the workflow management on the high performance computing um, system. It's now officially supported or has been for a while at NERSC. And then the data that comes out of those workflows, we run through what we call builders. Um, those builders basically uh, take that parse data and derive uh, calculated properties, uh, smaller database, smaller collections uh, that then feed into the feed into the website. All of that is. Um, driven primarily by uh, the NERSC file system and also a MongoDB at NERSC. We have long-term storage at NERSC where our raw calculations go in in HPSS and all of our uh, development is open source on, on GitHub, including the development and operations uh, repository where which we use to do continuous cloud deployments, uh, build Docker images and, uh, and, in, uh, and trigger code pipelines on AWS that that approach in the last few years has just um, really guaranteed us a, a good uptime that we weren't able to guarantee before with on-premise services. Um, what that also means is that a, the MongoDB that is central to our entire workflow and builder um, infrastructure uh, lives in the cloud in Atlas. So we have a managed uh, MongoDB Atlas cloud that is connected to our AWS deployment through uh, peering connections. It kind of right now is uh, synchronized uh, to some parts of our on-site MongoDB. And then that database together with our API and web services um, drives that website. Uh, the lower right box, uh, just to give you a bigger picture, uh, is what makes us a pure data resource. A pure data resource is a designation by the, the Department of Energy that we are good data stewards. Um, we are the only project in their list of uh, uh, data resources that's in the material science uh, domain. Uh, part of what has made us a pure data resource is that we also assign uh, digital object identifiers to all our materials detail pages. So it's very citable, it's, uh, it's very findable. Um, the DOIs also have metadata for their description. So things, um, these materials also show up on the uh, Google dataset search uh, just by the metadata provided through the, through our DOIs. Um, we also have collaborated in the past with Nomad to uh, provide all our raw calculations. Um, this part about Nomad, and I've alluded that to it in our um, in my description, is probably going to be replaced with open data in AWS. 
So we're now in a, a sponsored project in, in AWS Open Data, which allows us to um, provide our data in AWS without having to cover egress and storage costs, since all our data is publicly accessible and um, available. Um, but that that part is in progress, and it's also a stepping stone to move all the, the this part at the top, our workflows, our builders, and the and the related CPU into the cloud, so that we might not have to uh, rely on uh, on NERSC as much, other than our high performance computing and running calculations. Um, okay. So let's get into the cloud aspect of it a little bit and, and how we've transitioned. Um, this thing looks a little bit complicated, but I'll, I'll go through it. Um, at the very top, if you look at it from a HTTP request from the internet perspective, um, sits Cloudflare. Um, Cloudflare um, uh, connects through a load balancer to our network load balancer in Cloudflare. And then uh, basically anything from the network balancer to our backend services and MongoDB sits in the same AWS region, namely for us US East one. Uh, Cloudflare outside of our uh, uh, AWS region automatically pushes, it has a log push feature that pushes our logs that uh, uh, from Cloudflare directly to Datadog, which is our uh, monitoring service. Um, and then uh, in terms of the networking, uh, any request that comes in through the network load balancer basically hits first our network of Kong nodes. Kong, as I said, and I'll explain a little bit more later, takes care of um, knowing which request and which route for a specific host goes to which backend service. So that's that. Those are these black uh, arrows. Um, it also um, the the network architecture also has target groups and and subnets defined that can then talk to. Uh, deeper resources like an RDS database um, or an Elastic database that we have, Redis database, uh, Elastic Cache database. And um, basically this uh, Kong level is the first, um, 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 I would say layer that, that takes care of a lot of things that, that usually would be implemented as part of an, of an app in the backend, namely, user management, API keys, uh, uh, rate limiting, um, um, course, and so on. So there's a lot of plugins for Kong that before a request even hits our backend service, uh, it can take care of these lower hanging fruits. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and it also separates the concern of the backend developers in, in our group that write on that work on the API and that work on the portal, not needing to actually deal with any of these uh, standard web development uh, issues. Um, the all our uh, backend services then sit in their own private subnet. So Kong um, is indicated sits in a public subnet. It it, it accepts uh, traffic through the network balancer from the public. Uh, the private subnet has no internet gateway, so there's no way you can get from the public into our private subnet behind Kong. So anything needs to go through Kong. Only Kong can connect to these uh, private services and. Um, the API that sits in this private security group has a peering connection to our Mongo Atlas uh, um, deployment in the same region. That's what I've um, uh, basically described in the previous slide. So this connection here uh, through this peering connection is, is, is reliable, it's low latency, and it's intra-region traffic. So it's a factor 10 cheaper than having to go outside of, of the AWS region and send all of this through the internet. One thing that is a bigger picture future perspective that we've started working on is uh, it would be nice to have an integration from our private services. So from, from the API or the web service uh, to on-premise on resources at Berkeley Lab or at NERSC. Um, that would work through a VPN connection and, uh, and through ESNet. ESNet has a, uh, kind of a network connection uh, directly into US East 1. And we could use that connection in the future to um, maybe expose services to our users that are relying on on on-premise uh, resources. Okay. Um, next step in that transition was uh, making sure that everything runs as or is designed as infrastructure as code. Um, right from the from the get-go, I I try to make sure that that anything that we do in this uh in this transition is is handled and version controlled 
through configuration files, in this case, AWS CloudFormation. Uh, there are things like Terraform and others we, we could use to make um, these definitions more uh, cross-cloud uh, capable, but CloudFormation has been around so long and it's just uh, the first um, um, service that basically supports every every new feature that that AWS deploys before it it actually makes it downstream into Terraform and other things. So I've tried to stay as bare metal as I can here. Um, the way this uh, infrastructure as code works for us is we have a, a GitHub repository that's called our DevOps repo. So it's a little bit different than in this uh, uh, schema here, but um, any push to a, a branch, a release branch in our source repository will trigger a pipeline that builds up uh, these uh, resources in the cloud. Uh, the AWS uh, base resources like the, the ECS cluster, the virtual private uh, uh, network, VPC networks, SQL databases, network load balancers, so things that are just always there uh, are defined in their own cluster YAML file. And um, then the dynamic part is basically uh, designing and building all the app resources, meaning we need for our MP services, the API, the web, and Kong. We're building Docker images uh, defined through code, code built projects. And um, basically, any code change will tag and build a new image that is then pushed to ECR, which is the container registry in AWS. And um, when that next step in the code pipeline hits, um, that step knows to go to ECR, pull, pull the images, and deploy Fargate tasks accord, according to a certain service definition. So all of that is uh, handled through YAML files and uh, and automated uh, uh, code pipelines that base that only depend on a Git repository and and continuous integration that way. Um, what does that code pipeline look like? Um, so this is just a, a 10 foot view here, but as I said, the first step is cloning or retrieving the, the new GitHub, uh, the new Git uh, code. Um, basically the latest uh, revision here, the base resources is, is in, on a day-to-day -day operation, something that it basically just runs through because the base resources as the VPC, SQL and stuff, they're already there. Um, sorry, I keep jumping back and forth. And um, the one of the crucial steps then is building the uh, the three major services and their images. So we have uh, Kong images that that need to be that that run in front of our two backend services, which is Matil's project and MP Contrips for data contributions. Um, that way, we're making sure that the code we run in production is um, very close or the same to the code that we run um, while we develop or while we set up previews and other things. The final two steps in this code pipeline is, is deploy the private subnets, which are the backend services. So in, in this case, this is MP contrips and MP. And then if that is successful uh, and Kong also needs to be updated, for instance, then the public service, uh, namely the, that Kong layer is also uh, deployed. There's two ways that we make sure that we have a smooth, smooth transition as we deploy. And for both of them, we're using the blue-green strategy, um, which means we would um, basically bring up an entire new stack and then run that stack on a, a preview subdomain. And if everything is good and, and looks fine, we flip a switch and move uh, uh, blue to green and green to blue. Um, that also includes databases, MongoDB databases, if we have uh, database upgrades um, or data up updates that we need to deploy. Uh, this blue-green strategy works a little different for the private subnets versus the public Kong subnet. For the public Kong subnet, it's uh, AWS ECS that takes care of blue-green deployment, so that's automated. It, uh, since it sits behind a, a network balancer, it will uh, uh, pull up that extra stack. It will uh, reroute network traffic through a um, through a test listener, so the network balancer will listen to traffic from that Kong deployment. And uh, if everything is OK, I can manually take the old one down and 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 switch to the new one. Um, what? Oh, sorry. <laughs> can hear somebody talk. Yeah, somebody's uh, not muted. James, could you mute, please? James Wade. Oh, shit. 
Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Patrick. All Continue. No, all good. That's all tape. Um, so uh, for the deep, for the private for the sub private subnets, it's a little different because we have Kong sitting in front of those private subnets and can use uh, Kong upstream definitions uh, to basically switch these backend services uh, uh, from production to preview and the other way around. Um, basically, that the way this works in on a day to day basis is that we the private. Uh, subnets are the ones that we're basically continuously deploying and need to be nimble and fast to do if we need if we have updates to ship. Kong, on the other hand, updates rarely, and uh, we just kind of there's a maintenance updates that we need to do. But Kong is very reliable, sitting in front of these uh, backend services, and we can use the blue king blue green strategy in Kong to basically just change configuration instantly, which which of these um, services to talk to. Um, Okay, so uh, I want to talk a little bit more about what our Datadog monitoring looks like um, for our microservices. Um, so on the left is uh, one of our Fargate uh, configurations. AWS Fargate is a serverless uh, a, a service where we don't run our own EC2 instances and bring them up and down. We leave that to Fargate and we have task definitions that that as they get updated with new Docker images, uh, it'll automatically uh, deploy new Fargate tasks based on uh, CPU and memory definitions that we that we define ahead of times. So each of that, each of those tasks, like here is um, basically each of these uh, orange layers here indicates a task within AWS Far Fargate. Um, each task can have a, a list of containers running in it. Uh, for instance, in our case, there would be, uh, say, uh, the MP website would be one container. Next to it runs the MP API on the same local host. So in ta within tasks, you basically do local host communication, which is very reliable. And then it also has, uh, in addition to these application containers, there is the Datadog agent sitting as a sidecar container in the same uh, task, which allows these application containers to, to send this its traces, metadata, its logs uh, directly to the sidecar container. The logs per se go don't go through the sidecar container. They go through what's called FireLens. So that's a uh, basically a uh, an AWS uh, service that that can take JSON logs and very efficiently keep pushing them out uh, to a consumer like Datadog. And all of this traffic, sort of traffic from the Datadog agent that sits in each of these uh, con uh, tasks as a sidecar container, and the logs that come through FireLens are going through VPC endpoints that are directly connecting our tasks in US East One region with a with Datadog tasks sitting in the US East One region. So, same idea here. Instead of go instead of setting sending these logs back to the internet paying 0.9 per gigabyte 0.9 dollars per gigabyte send um uh to AWS we're we're spending a, a tenth of uh, we we don't spend any data on the log uh, any any money on the log uh traffic uh with e AWS since the US the within US East regions uh, within regions this traffic is 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 free and the VPC endpoint is just paid by our and not by by data processed. So that's been uh, a very important aspect of why we chose uh, Datadog from the beginning, because it, it really gave me peace of mind that I can control the expenses even as we scale up. There is, of course, expenses on the Datadog side as we ingest that data and uh, we index it and, and, and make and prepare it for, for um, dashboards and others. Um, but uh, that's a part that is that Datadog has a lot of control over, and we have control over what we're parsing and what we're looking at. But in terms of raw file transfer, the VPC endpoints have have really helped us uh, get this architecture up and running. Um, on the Datadog side, then there's um, a lot of things that that this opens up to once these logs are in. All logs can be live tailed. There's detection rules of of which ones we want to maybe index and then keep for 15 days, so we can look look them up at at any time. Um, it it can generate um, metrics uh, based on the logs that are coming in, which are then uh, available for a much longer time than than the live uh, indexed uh, logs. 
and over time that you can we can define um, uh, monitors and anom and then detect anom anomalies based on these uh, metrics that you've defined. And um, basically, uh, one of the um, primary advantages also of Datadog is that there's a lot of uh, dashboard capabilities that you can use once you've you've uh, set up all the system reporting from your services and from your logs into Datadog that allows you to get a a a picture of of your network architecture without any um, uh, blind spots. So that's kind of the selling argument always for Datadog is that uh, you have a a cloud monitoring service that's deeply integrated with the cloud deployment and allows you to um, very easily identify and quickly identify uh, issues as they come up. Another thing that was important for us is that um, if there are things that we want to go back to uh, and in the past and say like we want to see what the logs at that point in time were, we can rehydrate from S3 uh, archives uh, into the same data doc infrastructure and and parse and look and query the, the logs just as, as fine as with the live ones. Uh, Datadog take, takes care of those archives for us. Basically, as logs come in, it also backs them up to S3 storage uh, on our end. So these data, these logs are never lost uh, and can be analyzed in the future. Um, this is what it looks like in my office. That's where I'm sitting right now. So there's a little screen uh, on the right where the Datadog dashboard is running. Um, I zoomed in a little bit. This is what it looked like actually for the fast, past four hours. Um, and there's a lot more dashboard capabilities that I that 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 I that I have and that I could um, design. But at a minimum, this is what I look at every day: is what's the current error rate? Am I somewhere in a in a warning territory? Is there something going on that I should be looking at? Uh, where do we sit with the number of status, a uh, number of requests, um, in terms of whether there are any errors or warnings or notices? Um, What's the API uptime, the portal uptime? How many warnings and errors do we get uh, from the API and the portal? We want to want those two to be as close to 100% as possible, of course. And then I have other things that are constantly uh, kind of showing up on this dashboard is, is uh, the requests by continent. So which part is currently active in our API and our website? How much data are we transferring? And then the same. Um, uh, metrics across time, basically, also cumulative over that time period that I've chosen. So I can go in here and say, like, yeah, for the past day, for the past week, how much data have we served? How much requests have we served? Something going on right now that's out of the ordinary that I should look at, and then I can go and and look at the logs from each of the backend services, or from Cloudflare, um, or from Kong. Um, so that has been extremely powerful for us. Um, See, we are in time 146. Yeah, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, last piece of this presentation is uh, is a little bit more details on Kong and the Kong way. Uh, that's how Kong sells it themselves. Is basically instead of uh, having all these aspects of um, web request handling like authentication, monitoring, logging, group permissions, rate limiting, caching, security, and so on, all within your backend services, you kind of pull them out into its own layer and the plugins will take care as the web, as the request moves through Kong um, to apply certain things to that request. And then uh, normally this works with uh, setting headers. So once the request is forwarded to the upstream service, that upstream service gets information in the header that has been inserted by Kong and can kind of digest that information very easily. Um, for us, the, the plugins that we use is bots. So we kind of block certain bots that we don't like. There's course. We send metrics to Datadog directly. We uh, impose request size limits. We have a session management plugin um, that uh, does the user sessions. API keys, group management to actually have resource level um, restriction on certain maybe API points, for instance, or maybe apps in the website that we don't want to expose to everybody yet. Uh, rate limiting is important so that users don't um, hammer our infrastructure. And then uh, uh, one last piece was a custom authentication plugin that I wrote that that allows you allows us to um, um, use uh, third party OAuth and email to get users signed up. Um, 
then after I'm after these plugins have run, uh, we also define these backend services as what's called upstreams in Kong. So there's a Kong has a ring balancer because there's multiple of these services, right? There could be three, four, five, six tasks running, serving all uh, all the requests, and then Kong basically cycles around those four, five, six tasks in that private security group to um, send a request to, and that. Uh, the ring balancer is pretty simple in Kong. It just hops around. Uh, it has targets defined, which are the IP addresses, potential IP addresses for this uh, set of tasks in the backend um, in the Fargate uh, service. Um, so in detail is my last, last slide. Uh, what does that configuration in Kong look like? Uh, it's all managed with uh, DEC, which is short for Decla declarative Kong. The command line interface that allows you to uh, update and uh, and work with the Kong configuration uh, through an admin API that Kong provides. Um, the services are basically just defining uh, which routes do I have, so which which uh, um, which URLs do I want to support for a specific host name, and uh, each of those services points to an an, an upstream. Uh, that is in in our in the case of our backend services defined based on the subnet. So this is where the the blue green comes back in from earlier, where uh, I would say private subnet two would run in production. The services are up and running. I would deploy into private subnet one, which is a, a set of IP addresses. I would uh, point this to the preview service uh, for uh, MP Web, right? And just for the web service here. And uh, once once we're happy that the previous service is running well, we just basically flip those two around with a simple uh, API request to the Kong admin API, and then preview is live. Uh, so, sorry. Yeah. Uh, in terms of consumers in Kong, so the our users are all um, are called consumers in Kong. They have they're defined by their provider for their which OAuth provider they use. Turkey is an email. Uh, based OAuth provider, and they have their API key saved with them, and Kong takes care of all of them. So once once the request is through Kong, an API key doesn't have a meaning anymore. It only has a meaning for for Kong. Kong translates it into group permissions and ACLs, and then the upstream service just con consumes those headers and the ACL definitions. Um, and this OAuth server that 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 I wrote runs in the same task as Kong, so they're basically talking to each other in terms of creating consumers uh, on the local host. Um, this is just a, a quick um, overview slide over the for the uh, for that plugin and OAuth server that I that I'm using and uh, wrote for our uh, purposes. Um, it it provides uh, the profile.materialsproject.org service where people. Uh, go to log into any uh, MP service, maybe MP Contrips or or the Materials Project main website. They're all served by this um, centralized uh, OAuth. Um, we're also supporting email because there is um, industry partners that may not be able to get accounts with one of these providers. And our email um, logins are uh, enabled by Portier, which is an open source uh, email-based auth, email auth service and works the same way as all the other OAuth uh, providers uh, through uh, Grant, which is the OAuth server that has, that that runs all the, and maintains all the configurations and sent, and, and works through the OAuth cycle for each of the providers. And then this OAuth um, server talks to the Kong admin API to create consumers and sessions. Um, so there's a lot of details that I, that I could talk about this thing alone, but I wanted to just give an, an overview of what uh, these uh, pieces of our infrastructure are. And I think that's where I'm at in time. In terms of summarizing, I just say MP is our uh, is the leading research platform and open source code for material sciences. I've tried to make that clear in our infrastructure in our in the in the introduction. We've went we went through a major transformation of our uh, data and compute from on-premise uh, DOE supercomputing resources to cloud cloud and infrastructure as code. Um, this has, in my eye, my view, only been the start because there's still our entire workflow and data processing pipelines that that could benefit from a transition to the cloud. 
and we started that process. Uh, we get full end-to-end -end visibility into our stack with Datadoc. There are no blind spots. We have a dashboard that, that we can run and, uh, and inspect all our services as they run live. We have Kong, which enables our microservices infrastructure uh, in terms of routing requests and also separates concerns for the developers. And then all three of them have basically made this possible for us as scientists, primarily scientists who are also good engineers to make this happen for Matilde's project. So thank you very much. Um, I hope I didn't go too fast. No, you did great. Thank, thank you, Patrick. That was fantastic. Um, I, I do want to mention, I uh, unfortunately, I, I violated the first rule of being a meeting host where I forgot to uh, mute my phone. And when I was doing the introduction to Patrick, I got a text which distracted me. And uh, <laughs> Patrick, once you started talking, I realized I neglected to mention um, in terms of the work that Patrick has done, um, you know, obviously, as you, everyone can tell, he's he's a big Amazon user, um, but I would also describe Patrick as being our probably our most advanced AWS user at the lab uh, in terms of using cloud infrastructure um, in ways that go beyond just using EC2 and S3 and, and the basic um, services that most people tend to use. Um, and I also wanted to mention that, um, you know, as Patrick has done, um, or evolved this project over time. Patrick is also the only user at the lab right now who has a savings plan, an AWS savings plan uh, in use. Um, and Patrick also did a lot of work uh, analyzing his workflow, his consumption, uh, his usage in order to figure out how much he was going to be spending and then um, purchased that CERP savings plan at a level that was pretty much right on target for what he expected it to be. So. Um, yeah. really just, it's always fun hearing Patrick talk about his project over time, the last couple of years, how it's evolved from what it was four years ago to where it is now. Um, and just yeah. the work he's done to get it there. So, um, I apologize for not mentioning that earlier, but, um, I just wanted to mention that, that, uh, that's where Patrick's coming from. This is where I've been seeing this going on. So, um, I do want yeah. to open the floor to a couple of questions real quick. We don't have a ton of time left, but I know there was one, if not two in the chat. Um, if you have a question, you, uh, you want to jump in, uh, please unmute yourself and uh, ask away. Well, I guess I can ask the question. Um, uh, she Lynn was asking, uh, will this project uh, look into biomaterials or composites? And if biomaterials means organic materials, then unlikely. We're more on the inorganic side. We're doing molecules. We did um, metallic, metallic organic frameworks from a collaboration with another uh, project in Minnesota in the past. Um, but yeah, I would have to, I would have to hear more details what exactly that would en entail. But if it's organic, then it's unlikely. Anyone else want to jump in with something? Um, I, I will ask if this is probably a little inside baseball here, but um, so Patrick underwent a process with directly with some AWS engineers a few months back um, for had a number of direct one on one sessions with some people that um, he, that he arranged through AWS um, to really fine tune his infrastructure um, and how he uses services, how they're configured, how they're set up. I was wondering if you could spend a minute or two talking about that process yeah. um, and what that what that brought to you into the project. That's a good. That's a good uh, segue. So it's called the uh, Well-Architected Infrastructure Review. I have to say that was pretty late in the project, right? Because since this started already three years old, three years ago, um, most of this way I went kind of on my own, trying to design something that is that that works for us. Uh, the Well-Architected Review came in just before we went global and kind of gave me the the confidence that what I have designed is actually going to hold up and it's going to work. Um, it was also the first time in three years that I've in that I've basically spent uh, probably a month or two every week with an AWS engineer talking about the ins and outs of my entire infrastructure. So that that hasn't happened before, and that was definitely very valuable. What came out of it was a list of recommendations from that AWS expert going forward where we could improve or should improve or should be careful. Like two that come to mind right now for me are one, for instance, the private subnets that I've defined in terms of scaling up might be a little small in terms of the number of IP addresses. The reasons I the reason I kept them small is because I have to define them in Kong. 
so as upstream targets and i didn't want to have hundreds of ip addresses sitting there trying to cycle having the ring balance to cycle through all these ip addresses um but as we scale right now we're just kind of just fine but if if our demand and when our demand grows we might have to change those uh ip subnets uh, the, the 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 number of ips in those subnets and with it the subnet definition and the second thing is um we could get more bang for our buck using amd uh um based images uh which um which are more performant and just a combination of uh cpu and performance basically gives us a 20 could give us a 20 percent either saving or 20 percent boost in performance um so that's some that's a longer term thing where we if we could switch our images over and run our infrastructure on a on a different architecture um we could actually get more bang for a buck at aws so those are but the list is long like it's like 10 15 very uh specific recommendations and a list that i got at the end of this process that's sitting in a github issue for me to be eventually tackled <laughs> when the day comes <laughs> Yeah, well, it's a great process. I think my primary, as, as Jeff said, was just having a one-on-one -on -one with an AWS expert in terms of confidence that this architecture will hold up. That was probably the best payoff of all of that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, we got about a minute. Does anyone else want to jump in with one final question? Last opportunity. All right. Well, um, again, Patrick, thank you so much for uh, for bringing this to everyone's attention today. I really appreciate your time, the talk, the topic, the content. Um, very informative. Um, really, really enjoyed that. So, like I said, I appreciate it. Thanks for level, having me. Always, for me, it's always fun to see what you got going on that's new. So, um, really yeah. appreciate the time. I enjoy talking about this, so I'm always happy if there's an audience that would want to hear about it. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Rick, I saw your hand up. Were you trying to ask a question? No, or I was just saying Clinton? thank you. Okay, perfect. A little bit premature. Great presentation. <laughs> thank, you, Patrick. thank you, Rick. Appreciate well, it. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and look forward to next month's discussion around chat GPT. So uh, please join us then. So thanks so much. Bye.